Okay, good morning. Um, this is uh, January 13th, and we are in a joint meeting of health and welfare in the Senate and House Health Care. Uh, Representative Lippert, uh, Bill Lippert, is chair of House Health Care, and he and I will be uh, sharing the um, the work of the day, moving the committee along, chairing the committee. I'm Senator Ginny Lyons. Um, any comments, Representative Lippert, that you'd like to make? No, uh, just to say that I think it's, uh, again, to appreciate that we're doing this jointly. I think it's uh, efficient for our committees and also for our witnesses. And, uh, and we both are committed to moving this forward in an expeditious manner. Absolutely. Um, and just uh, FYI for committee members, uh, the House leadership from House Healthcare asked Jen Carby to put together a new um, grid for Act 6, Act 21 with a column for recommendations. And that should now be up on both of our web pages. And I wanna say thank you, Representative Lippert and others who uh, made that happen because I think it's extremely useful. So with that in mind, um, we have a long list of folks to testify, and I know that a couple of people may be on time crunches. I know that David Hurley, he is, um, so we'll, we'll probably start with David, and then I'm going to look at Chair Kevin Mullen of Green Mountain Care Board. Do you have a, a time crunch? It helps to get off uh, mute first. Um, no, I, I, I'm at your leisure. Okay, well, good. So we'll, we'll move through the witnesses. I can't promise that they're going to be in the same order, but ultimately we will get to some level of conversation so that we can keep this uh, work moving forward. I think both committees would like to make it happen as quickly as possible. Yes. So um, David Hurley, he is here. And he, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then we'll hear your testimony uh, today. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Lyons and Chair Lippert um, and other committee members. I'm David Herlihy. I'm the Executive Director of the Board of Medical Practice. Go right ahead with your testimony. So um, I um, participated in the, uh, the work group that was created under Act 21. And um, uh, I also participated in, in the full group and in the subgroups and attended um, the majority of the, the meetings held. And um, I know I, I, you heard a lot of testimony from Warren Hibbert last week. And uh, so I think I can be brief and just say that um, uh, I agree with, with uh, virtually everything that, that Lauren said. Um, the, the board's uh, perspective um, was was made known during the, the work group process, and I and I believe that um, our perspective, which was um, pretty much shared with OPR, was was uh, addressed in the uh, process, and um, we support the recommendations. Uh, of the report, both for the, the short-term solution for transitioning away from, from where we are right now with um, uh, uh, unknown number of um, out-of-state unlicensed practitioners practicing by, by telemedicine uh, with, with Vermont patients and instituting the, the short-term solution, which calls for uh, a registration beginning by April 1st and uh, we also um, support the, the long-term recommendation, which is to create a couple new um, classes of, of credential um, to uh, provide for um, you know, less, less burdensome, uh, but um, uh, credentials that, that, but that also come with um, less um, um, scope of, of practice in terms of the, uh, uh, time or number of patients or both. And um, I think that it reflects an appropriate balance between uh, the desire to, to uh, encourage out-of-state licensees or out-of-state practitioners to be, become licensed to, to, to practice in Vermont and serve Vermont patients and uh, increase access to care 
Uh, and on the other hand, it also is balanced with the um, uh, desire of the state to provide for the um, uh, safe uh, uh, care uh, of, of its uh, residents um, through the, the licensing and regulation process. The, um, the, there are a couple of small points where OPR is asking for uh, sort of an add-on um, that's not really at the core of the telemedicine uh, issue uh, for the ability to issue provisional licenses and the Board of Medical Practice discussed that and um, um, it's not um, something that the board uh, desires that kind of authority. Um, and I, I know that OPR presented that um, uh, you know, with themselves separately and, and we don't take issue with them doing that, but it's, it's not something that, that the board is interested in. Um, so, and I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions you, you may have. Questions for David Hurley. Okay. Thank you. That was very clear. Appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, it, so I'm, I'm going to move to uh, Chair Mullen of the Green Mountain Care Board simply because you were not at our committee uh, earlier to testify on this and to see what uh, additional information you might have beyond what we have heard from folks. And then we'll go back to Lauren Hibbert and uh, others who are on the agenda. And this, and this, if I may, this, this is a focuses on an Act 6 uh, COVID flexibility extension, which is my understanding. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, for the record, my name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. And uh, for the most part, um, we would support um, the proposals that are in front of you. I did want to uh, bring up a couple of uh, caveats. Um, what worked well for the Green Mountain Care Board under the previous legislation was the flexibility that uh, was allowed to uh, make changes to the processes. And um, definitely could see how that could be helpful moving forward for a period of time. Um, not so sure that I would go all the way to March 31 of 23. Um, but again, I'm just looking at it from the Green Mountain Care Board's perspective because we don't do a lot of um, regulatory work um, during um, the first couple of months of the year. So um, if I was to make a recommendation, it would be for calendar year 22 and not going out as far as it is. But there may be valid reasons for um, others to have the extension to uh, May 31st. Um, it, the flexibility worked great. We were able to take out the um, uh, non-financial aspects of the uh, budget process, and um, you know, shorten the time frame, and um, took away some of the reporting requirements, um, and that was necessary in that particular point in time. I wouldn't like to see a um, blanket uh, statement in any legislation like what I saw in the uh, letter from the association and specifically um, let me uh, focus right in on the point where I don't agree with what the, the group has proposed. And that is um, the, the blanket exemption for um, workforce retention and uh, new hires and such. The board always takes those matters into consideration. And I would say, Again, not speaking on behalf of the whole board, but I would say that um, a number of my votes in last year's budget process um, were directly with the understanding that there was going to be um, pressures on the uh, workforce. And that's why they needed larger than historical increases in, in the budgets. So um, hmm. the, the big concern is that if you were to do a blanket statement, um, you would basically um, exempt all those um, um, 
expenses related to the workforce uh, due to the shortage. And in doing so, um, if it's not carefully worded, you would take away, for example, there could be an increase in revenue um, because there's more dollars going into uh, the workforce because of higher demand. And um, so in some, some respects, those could offset some of the costs that are gonna be seen in uh, what's gonna be necessary to have uh, a suitable workforce. The, the board recognizes that um, hospitals are under extreme pressure right now and are going to have to um, pay to retain and pay to recruit. And this isn't something new. We've been talking about this um, for the last five years about the fact that um, we were in a workforce crisis and the pandemic has just exacerbated that. And um, it's really exacerbated it into almost all fields of uh, labor. Um, even the military now is um, creating sign-on sign bonuses up to $50,000. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's, sign me uh, up. Yeah, I don't think they want us old people. Oh, no, they um, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that's my, uh, my biggest concern with the language that I've seen in the uh, association letter. Um, I don't think that uh, it's necessary because um, we take those uh, factors into consideration before we make a decision. And I could see where it could do some harm in some cases if they're, um, if the language is such that it's just specifically exempted, so. Um, do you think you could get uh, so your testimony in writing? I mean, just a few bullet points about the, the comments that you've made. Um, it, it's really about the exemption, workforce exemption when the, within the budget process is what I understand. Yes, that's, that's yeah. my concern. Okay. And, and let me just be further, uh, more clarity on that. Um, if there is that exemption in the budget process, it would put uh, extreme pressure on the commercial rates because the change in charges would have to be adjusted to uh, reflect that. So you're putting the, the total um, uh, costs of the, the workforce situation on uh, a, a subset of the, the people using healthcare and that's um, those that are uh, commercially insured. And so it'll just be more pressure for people to gravitate towards um, what I would call underinsured plans and because that's what they would be able to afford. Right. And uh, so those are the considerations really. And I can put that into uh, bullets and uh, get it to both committees. Oh, thank you very much. That's helpful. One quick question before Representative Goldman asks her question. Uh, how, uh, remind us how the um, federal dollars are counted within the budget or not. So um, they are counted in, in the respect that um, we're looking at a number of different benchmarks. One of those benchmarks is days cash on hand. So federal dollars have um, uh, done amazing things to um, protect our hospitals. And, and really a shout out goes to our congressional delegation because um, Senators um, Leahy and Sanders and uh, Congressman Welch have uh, tirelessly fought for Vermont. And I think that Vermont has benefited from their leadership in Washington in that um, the rural dollars, especially that have helped um, come to Vermont are, are probably more per capita than um, a lot of other states, which is true of a lot of things. And we're thankful for that congressional delegation help. And because of that, um, some hospitals, especially the smaller ones, um, really um, haven't seen the full squeeze of what some of their peers have seen elsewhere. And so um, I'm, I'm glad to say that today, knock on wood, um, we don't have a hospital that's on the verge of uh, closing their doors um, because of financial reasons. Um, that doesn't mean that um, we have you know, sustainable hospitals moving forward, because we know that that is not the case. It's uh, very difficult for rural hospitals, not only in Vermont, but across the country. And we also know that uh, um, UVM has had some um, 
very tough things that they're dealing with that um, has placed them in a totally different financial situation than they were just a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, there's a lot of concern still, but, you know, a lot of gratitude too for our congressional delegation. And uh, those monies have, uh, have uh, continued to come in. And so just to give you an example of one of our smallest hospitals, Springfield, um, within the, the, uh, the last two months of the, of the previous calendar year, they received uh, two payments of approximately 1.4 million each under that, which um, isn't a lot of money for somebody like UVM, but it's a heck of a lot of money for these small hospitals. And um, it's been a, a big help. And so we factor all those things in, and there's a number of benchmarks that we compare them to their peers in the Northeast and across the country and to their peers within specific classes of hospitals um, so you're comparing critical access hospitals to other critical access hospitals. You're um, comparing your community hospitals to other community hospitals, and you're comparing your academic medical center to other academic medical centers. So there, there's a lot of um, different uh, variables in the process, but um, certainly that money is looked at. It's not uh, um, just forgotten. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, that was helpful. Uh, the, we know that the hospitals were in dire straits, many of them prior to the pandemic and having federal dollars come in has been a, a real uh, terrific support. Uh, so thank you. Representative Goldman has a question. Thank you. And thank you, Chair Mullen. I was just wondering um, if someone or maybe Jen could point to where on the spreadsheet she created Chair Mullen's comments on concerns about exempt expenses would live. So I don't have that spreadsheet, so I'm going to have yeah, to that's why uh, I'm... phone Jen, <laughs> phone a friend. Phone a Good friend. Morning. That's why I was... Jennifer, yeah. yep. Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. I think it's actually in testimony that you will be hearing this morning from the provider coalitions. So I think they have proposed some language. I'm not sure if it was in an earlier version, but it is not in the, um, not in the spreadsheet. Um, okay, thank you. It, for, for one thing, it wasn't underlined, so I didn't realize until Chair Mullen started talking about it and I went to look for it that it was proposed new language. Okay, question answered. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Chair Mullen? I, I would just say, and we have, of course, we haven't, we haven't made any decision. We're hearing testimony at this point in time, but uh, to the degree that uh, Chair Mullen puts forward this proposed difference uh, that if he, I would ask if he would work with uh, legislative council to also uh, have language that we could consider. Absolutely. Thank you, that's good. And then, then we can make a decision. Yes, then we, we can make proceed. decision. We have to look at it first before we can decide if we like it Absolutely. or not. Absolutely. Yeah, good. All right. Um, well, why don't we just move on to Lauren Hibbert then? Lauren is here. Yes. Hi, Good morning. Our, would, would you like to skip over me? I'm totally fine if you want to go straight to the coalition. Yeah, I, you know, I was, I was going to ask you if you would mind if we did that. Okay. I'm happy, I'm happy to be skipped. Okay. So then it's uh, Jessa Barnard and Devin Green. Are you testifying together or separately? We're testifying together and I will start and I apologize. I do have to hop off at 930 to testify on the fire prohibition on firearms in hospitals bill in House Judiciary, but I will try to make my remarks brief and then I'll be back on as soon as that is done. Um, and I think where I'll start is the broader picture from the coalition letter and then I'll talk about Vaz's um, proposal around the Green Mountain Care Board. So following up on last week's testimony, um, as we mentioned before, we're at the most critical point when it comes to staffing right now. Um, and so that's why we're urging you to extend regulatory flexibilities. And we really appreciate the committee talking about making some of those regulatory flexibilities permanent. We think that's 
a great idea. We want to explore that further, but we have absolutely no bandwidth to do that at this time. And we also um, really need the flexibilities to go into effect and not have anything bog it down. So what we're hoping for is to get um, the extensions now and then put into place a stakeholder process to um, look at what regulatory flexibilities could be made permanent going forward. Uh, we're also, along those same lines, we're also requesting that the um, committee seamlessly um, pass the telehealth recommendations from Act 21. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that there's no gap um, and that we're able to have the regulatory flexibilities around telehealth um, seamlessly without any disruptions. So if you... Um, I got a little nervous when we were talking about the Act 21 um, recommendations going to different committees. Um, if this needs a bigger process for those recommendations, we would ask that you take out the um, that temporary process for the next year and put it in this bill so that we can ensure that there's seamless regulatory flexibility for telehealth going forward. And then in terms of the Green Mountain Care Board, um, I'm really happy to hear that they would appreciate the uh, extension and flexibility as well. We can talk with them about the dates and what makes sense. Um, we're happy to do that. I, the reason I propose, and Jen, I'm sorry I didn't underline it, um, but the reason I propose new language around hospital budgets and allowing us flexibility in investing in workforce in our hospital budgets is that we are really nervous, and again, I'm speaking just for hospitals here, not the whole coalition, but we're really nervous when we hear the discussions that are happening in appropriations right now. We hear a lot of comments of, well, we really need to focus on the healthcare providers who get primarily Medicaid funding. This is where we should put the workforce dollars. Um, the hospitals, they can always just uh, increase their commercial rates. They can make it up. Um, but they don't understand that we can't make it up with the Green Mountain Care Board. We have a cap and we know that the Green Mountain Care Board does take these things into account, but we are really worried that we will be squeezed on both ends and not able to make those necessary investments into workforce. So what we're looking for is a commitment to allow hospitals to invest in workforce. If that is state dollars coming to hospitals for workforce, that is great. That will ensure that commercial rates do not go up. But if we can't get that, then we very much need that flexibility to get the workforce that we need now. The other piece that was outstanding. So was can you can you say give us the your final comment on you disagree with Chair Mullen, or you are willing to negotiate this provision? Where, where, is, where are the hospitals with this one? I mean, what the hospitals are looking for is the ability to freely invest in workforce so that they can serve the healthcare needs of Vermonters. And so to the extent, again, whether that is accomplished through state funding, great. Um, otherwise, we need flexibility with the Green Mountain Care Board. And if that's the Green Mountain Care Board making a statement that they will be providing that flexibility, we just need that commitment somehow. Okay. So I'm happy to talk to the Green Mountain Care Board further, but if they're not going to budge on this issue, then I would, I would like this language. Well, I think uh, it would be very helpful for you to engage with the Green Mountain Care Board and then... Um, follow up, I think, uh, with uh, our ledge council, if some agreement can be made, uh, you know, we, uh, we're, we're on a fast track here. So we want yes, to, uh, yeah, I appreciate so that. And yeah. I, <laughs> I will not slow this process down. So I cool. will talk with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and we will see what we can do. Thank you. That's great. And then my last comment is the budget process is in the house. Are you talking about the BAA? I am talking about the BAA and the retention okay. funding. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and just as a cautionary note to the Senate folks that the house healthcare committee is working with their 
um, Appropriations Committee and Representative Lipper can talk, speak to that if you would like, uh, but that is a sole separate process going on and ultimately it all comes together. So, right. uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna to try to speak to uh, no. the specifics, uh, uh, but we, we are very involved. The House, the House Appropriations Committee has now received recommendations from both the House Healthcare Committee and the House Human Services Committee uh, about uh, recruitment and retention monies. Uh, their, their deliberations are not finished, but they will be finished soon because they intend to vote today, I believe, uh, on a their, their proposed Budget Adjustment Act recommendations, which will then come to the House floor, as I understand it, uh, assuming things keep moving forward uh, next Thursday and Friday. So. Thank you. Good update. Uh, questions? Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Devin, I know you have to go. So if there's somebody else, but I'm just looking at um, your um, testimony that's on our website. So it, could you show us specifically or tell me specifically wh what provision on your testimony there's this disagreement about between? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to find it. Yes, yeah, can't find it. I agree, Senator Hardy. That, that's why I asked. So it. it's the third bullet um, and it's the sub bullet of the third bullet. <laughs> Where okay. the language <laughs> is it notwithstanding any provision? That yes. is the that's yeah, and that's where the Green Mountain Care Board agrees, and then the subsection B is the BAS language. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, it's on the next page. The top of the next. Very top of the page, exempt hospital investments in order to meet labor demands from the yes. budget to actual reconciliation. That part. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um I, I'm all I'm also uh, sensitive to the issue of uh, rate increases um, from the consumer perspective. Um, and if I, I completely hear you about needing to invest in, in workforce, um, and I'm hoping that we can find a solution that helps you be able to do that without increasing rates and costs for patients and consumers. And maybe the solution lies with something that is, is going to be in the budget adjustment as, as Representative Lippert was just talking about. But um, that would be my concern. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that's part of the concern from the Green Mountain Care Board also is, is we don't want to serve, solve the workforce shortage by putting it on the backs of people who need to access hospital services. So um, right. especially during a pandemic. <laughs> I agree. And it's and sorry to jump in there. It's our concern, too. It's just if we're going to have this discussion of hospitals don't need it um, because they can build commercial providers, I think we have to realize that that is the end result. You can't please don't leave us out of these retention funding uh, policies or, um, you know, there needs to be adequate funding for all of this for us to not have to make that move or we can't have these narrow lanes in place where we have the Green Mountain Care Board and then this also. Yeah, absolutely. I get that. And I don't think anybody, or at least I haven't heard it in this committee has said that. So I, I, I know no. you're sensitive to what you're hearing in other committees, but um, um, the, thanks for that clarification as to where the language was. Good. And I, just I, FYI, uh, Senator Hardy, before you came into the meeting, uh, Kevin Mullen of the Green Mountain Care Board did identify the cost shift issue uh, and didn't want to see any ex increased expenditures putting pressure on folks who then may have to seek um, a higher copay or out of pocket experience with their insurance. So, yeah, but, I heard, I heard um, Chair Mullen, I, I was here for that. Um, okay. I just missed the very, very beginning of the meeting, but. Um, yeah. And I agree, I think we need to be sensitive to that cost shift and putting it on to consumers, especially at this time, while also meeting the workforce needs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so Representative Leppert and then uh, yeah. Representative Cordes has a question. Yes, I, I would just caution us from, uh, uh, and I'm sure Devin understands this as well, but I would caution 
representing the House Appropriations Committee position on this as characterized by uh, Devin Green. I don't believe that is, uh, I don't believe that could possibly be the full understanding of the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, but there are in fact differences and not wanting to open up the issue of recruitment and retention issues, but there are historic disparities between payments in the hospital system and in the community system. And I think in the context of that, there may have been comments made that were that may be misconstrued as hospitals uh, can cost shift and therefore there's not an issue for hospitals. But there, it's a broader discussion and one which our House Health Care Committee has weighed in on quite strongly because the community system has been historically underfunded and has no ability to cost shift. So comments may have been made along the way, but I really doubt that that represents the House Appropriations Committee's uh, position regarding uh, rates and hospitals. So I just caution that we not. Uh, Thank you. No, and inadvertently, just to... inadvertently represent a position that may or may not be their position. No, and and. Correct. I do not believe that that is the position in the House Health Care Committee. This is what I've been the hearing. House, I'm talking committee. about the House Appropriations Committee. Or the House so. and the House Appropriations Committee, but there's also concern about the amount, and there has been discussion elsewhere around um, this ability, this perceived ability of hospitals being able to cost shift. Right. Yeah. Leave it there. I think it was a We've broader discussion that goes to a different time and place for right. us to engage. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Representative Cordes. Thank you, Chair. Um, when talking about retention, um, I know that short-term incentives for retention um, are, I think that's entirely appropriate when we're, we're triaging, um, actually triaging the, the healthcare system right now. Um, when we are in an emergency situation. However, I just want to make sure that we're also thinking of longer term retention um, in terms of wages, not just bonuses. And I'm talking specifically about um, community mental health services as well as hospital based um, services. And uh, is that something you can broadly speak to Devin? I think we're in favor of um, that for community services as well. And I I think what I, cause I do have to jump over to my other testimony, but I think what I can commit to is um, a discussion with the Green Mountain Care Board on this issue and, and hoping to come to an agreement with them. And I did just want to bring this to the attention of the committees. I don't wanna take this bill off track um, and with that, I think I, if it's okay with this committee, I'll probably um, leave it there and turn this over to Jessa to talk about the licensure extension a little bit, if that works. And then I'll be happy to come back and answer any other questions. Representative Cordes, does that answer your question? And uh, is, does that fit with your- It's more about um, long-term wage increases yeah. as a retention tool, but we could, I, I think that's a- that's a longer term discussion. Longer, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yes. No, we're, we're fine. Yeah, we're looking at a lot of things that we're going to have to evaluate going forward. Good, good catch. And I, I will say the one thing that I am very pleased about uh, over the past couple of sessions, it was putting forward the request for increased reimbursement for some of our community services and that that has been realized, but we continue to see uh, a deficit there. And we, you know, it's, it's, an, it's not, hasn't ended. And so you're absolutely right about our community services as well. So um, thank you, Devin. And we'll um, turn to Jessa Barnard. Thank you. Um, good morning, Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society, though here with my hat um, on behalf of the um, Healthcare Provider Coalition. Um, I think Devin walked through all of our overall asks, and since she has to hop off, I'm happy to answer other questions. The other, um, the only 
I think other outstanding issue was the conversation you heard um, at the last hearing about the out-of-state licensed healthcare professionals who come physically into Vermont to work on the staff of a licensed facility or FQHC. Um, we are still working to finalize a timeline on that with uh, Lauren Hibbert and OPR, but I, gen I think generally have agreement on the concept of a definition of what it means to be in the state temporarily. Um, we're just still, uh, we, we have not connected on what temporary, um, the definition of temporary means where we're, we're landing on that um, shortly. We can get back to you on that soon. Um, but I think otherwise, no other changes from what we presented to you um, last week. Uh, generally, all the other provisions would be the, our, our preference would be the March 31st, 2023. Um, so if there are any other questions, happy to help field those. I do have a question that's going to move into uh, Act 21, but so um, and if you would like, I'll hold that thought, but it relates to the licensure piece. Are there, are there any questions for Jessa? And then I'll ask my question. Okay. Um, so in thinking about out-of-state practitioners in-state and then um, the telemedicine piece, um, any thoughts there in terms of uh, any regulation or lack thereof? So our preference, as Devin mentioned this at the beginning, is that ideally all of the, the and, and David Hurley, he mentioned this framework, that both of the pieces, sort of the one-year piece and the long-term piece, um, move forward as soon as possible. So that's the one-year um, switch from deeming to registration. And then the, um, the solution that would come after that is a, um, reg a registration system for certain practitioners and then a licensure system for others based on the length of time they're practicing and how many patients they're seeing. Um, person my, my personal preference, if I could wave my magic wand, all of that would be moving as soon as possible and ideally going in Act 6 um, because we want to give OPR and the Board of Medical Practice time. If you recall, under the telehealth licensure piece of permanent piece of that, there will need to be some rulemaking specific to each type of profession or board um, because it is too hard, I, I think, to put all of the level of detail in statute. For example, some um, some boards and, and practitioners prescribe, others don't. Some do more urgent care type visits. Some are seeing patients for years. Um, so that needs some nuance and that needs rulemaking. And so ideally we'd like to see that authority um, set up as soon as possible so that process can start getting underway. So it will be in place a, you know, in, a, in a year. Um, if that is not possible to get all of that in Act 6, then we'd at least like to see the one year um, registration system, because uh, that really need that has the hard deadline of this March of going away. So um, that we feel like needs to move um, now. And then the other piece could potentially go in another bill. We'd still want that to pass this session. Um, but if it needed to go in another bill that got worked on um, later in the session, I think that would be acceptable, though. Happy to, you know, obviously, I'd want you to hear from OPR and the Board of Medical Practice on that. Good. Thank you. That's helpful. Sure. sure. Uh, any other questions for Jessa? Thank you. This is all becoming extremely clear. And um, so we'll move on to Lauren Hibbert. I think you're the last one on our witness list for Act 6. And then we can move on if there are any other comments on Act 21. So go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Lauren Hibbert, Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. I don't have additional comments from my testimony last week um, related to the Act 6 provisions. Um, the one ask this joint session um, gave to the witnesses last week was which of these provisions should become permanent. And for the OPR specific or the licensure specific provisions, um, we are not asking for any of the Act 6 flexibilities to become permanent law. We would just like the Act 21 language to be enacted. And I agree with Jessa's testimony, um, you know, the temporary provision um, from April 1st until July of 2023, um, 
<clears throat> I'm really open to that being part of the Act 6 extension. Um, I just, as Jessa um, said, there's a lot of work setting up the telehealth registration and licenses. There's going to be multiple sets of rules. Um, just you all are very aware of the rulemaking process. It's burdensome um, for an agency to go through appropriately, um, but it is um, substantial work. And I wanna make sure that we have enough of a, a, a ramp to get that work done um, in an effective collaborative way. Thank you. Questions? Uh Representative Houghton has a question. Thank you, yeah. Lauren. I just, and this is Act 21, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute, but I just want to confirm um, when you're talking about getting the rulemaking set up in time, this is based on the proposal that we would have that long-term registration or the long-term licensing process in place by July 1st of 2023. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. for OPR, what that means is we will need to promulgate, I think it's 16 or 17 specific rule sets related to telehealth across all of our professions. Um, we normally do um, three or four sets of rules a year. I think we're one of the most active rulemaking agencies just because we have so many professions under our umbrella. Um, our rules are not always incredibly complicated. Other agencies obviously adopt very complicated rules. Um, so it's not really a apples to apples comparison, but I do think these telehealth rules will be complicated because we'll want to hear from not only the professionals responsible for regulating the profession, we'll wanna make sure that they're consistent with each other to an extent, and we'll wanna make sure that they will work out in the field. So it's going to need probably a little bit more than what we typically do for rulemaking, where we can really rely on the institutional knowledge of the board and then have two public hearings. I, I just am foreseeing that we'll want to engage on a wider level because inherent to like our board of nursing is not doing telehealth from another state into Vermont. So they are practitioners in Vermont. They haven't done telehealth in Vermont. They clearly have a very valid and, um, and active perspectives on what should be required for a nurse doing telehealth into Vermont. And you know, we will want to hear them, but we'll also need to engage with some external stakeholders. So I, I'm just anticipating that will be a significant amount of work and um, assuming that it, that is the policy decision that Vermont makes, which I strongly encourage that you all do, um, the more notice we have to get that work started, the better. Great, and if I can just follow up, and, and um, we have a BAA request that we put in our referral level to the House Appropriations for OPR, everything you just discussed, some of that money would be used to help get to this point that you're talking yes, about. Yes, to subsidize okay. that work, yes. Thank you. Because, because we will be in a, in a gap where that work will be, will be being worked on without any fee revenue being generated. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate your help with that BAA. Okay. Terrific. Any other questions on the what theoretically we're still on Act Six, but and I think we were. Way I, back and forth. It, Sorry about think, that. Uh, but we'll no, that's okay. We'll come yeah. back to twenty one and go into a little more depth um, yeah. in a few minutes. Um, Representative Peterson. Yes, uh, Chair Lyons, and, and I have a comment uh, more than a question, and it and it relates to what you just said. Um, we heard a lot of great testimony today, but just from my standpoint, it would be so great to take Jen Carby's list of items that um, show the various acts and what we've done and the duration and somehow tie in what we just heard to that list because I'm lost. I got to tell you, I'm lost. I hear a lot of <laughs> stuff, but I don't know where stuff is in relation to that very comprehensive list that Jen, Jen Carby provided. So this is just a process comment. Yeah, yeah. I certainly would love to see us go down the list or have the, have yeah. the uh, 
person testifying say, hey, item five on page one, that's what I'm talking to. So somebody can follow it. Just so you 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 just said what I was going to say. So we're on the same (laughs) wavelength. I thought it would be helpful to hear the new testimony that we have. And then we will take Jen Carby's list, the new grid, and that um, thankfully your committee had recommended adding the recommendations column. We will go through that. Now, um, I'm thinking that at 10.15, we're going to take a break. So we can begin to go through the grid. Uh, Representative Peterson, this, is, um, this will be extremely helpful to us. We can look and see what the recommendations are, where we are with each of the proposals going forward, which one's permanent, which one's temporary, uh, which one's not to continue. And then we'll we'll stop at 1015, we'll come back to that. Um, We still have folks who are waiting to testify on Act 21 and we will come back to that testimony after we've gone through the grid on Act 6, because we don't want to, it's difficult when you're doing uh, both telemedicine and then everything else. So we're going to start with Act 6. Jen, I hope you're there and um, you can share your, 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 uh, your screen. I was going to say share your web page, um, share your screen with us and go through this. Thank you, Representative Peterson. Spot on. Yeah, I'm. <clears throat> Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. I am sharing my screen. I've made the column a little bit wider over here just to give us a little bit more room. So um, it's, I think, otherwise the same as what you had provided. I also added the piece uh, about the, the request from the Hospital Association on the um, budget review in that piece. Um, but the, so you just want to go through this. It sounds like from the top and and yes, please. And, um, so as much clarity as we can get on what it is that is being recommended for continuation or not, I mean, mostly looking at continuation, but there are a couple things, there's several things that are just not, that are going to expire. That's it. And as we do, if if I can say, as we do this, if we we may, we should also note. I I believe there may be a, a small number, but of areas where we are going to need to ask for additional testimony, uh, where we have not, uh, we did not anticipate perhaps uh, the full range of testimony that we needed for today. But so let's let if we can do that as we go through this, I think that'd be helpful. Excellent. Yeah. The first. Provision is the direction to the Agency of Human Services to consider modifying existing rules or adopting emergency rules uh, so that they can protect access to healthcare services, long-term services and supports, and other human services, and to consider the importance of the financial viability of providers who rely on public funding. This is currently in effect through March 31st of this year, and the Provider Coalition has recommended extending that through March 31st of next year. And per Representative Lippert's comment, uh, we definitely need to hear from the Agency of Human Services on this one. I'm making notes of that as well. The next section is the authority for the Secretary of Human Services to modify hospital provider taxes and waive or modify other provider taxes. Um, And that authority has expired. It was valid during the state of emergency and for six months afterward. And I added the dates in, we talked about them last time, but that state of emergency ended on June 15th. So um, this expired on December 15th. And there has been no recommendations so, so far to extend that. Next is the directive um, that in order to protect non-healthcare provider, uh, non-healthcare professional employees from COVID, that all healthcare facilities and human service providers follow guidance from the Department of Health regarding measures to address employee safety to the extent feasible. This is currently in effect through March 31st of this year and the Provider Coalition recommends extending through next year 
And I know there was also some discussion when we went through this the first time about um, perhaps adding guidance, not just from the Department of Health, but maybe from the CDC or other sources. Right. Uh, question there. Um, I see that, uh, is, did we hear, does the coalition have an opinion on adding CDC? Did we hear that? No, okay, we should get that. I don't recall what I what I think I recall testimony from from someone and whether it was the coalition or someone else was just um, wanting to make sure that there was enough clarity around which guidance to follow um, that it wouldn't be either confusing or overly burdensome to try to figure out with all the changing guidance what the what the most current version uh, is and consensus across all. Or that we not fall into having a list that is seen to be extensive ex or exclusive and yeah. find out that there's something else that should have been. But I see Representative Cordes, who I think brought this issue forward, uh, wishes to comment. Yes, I was just going to say I brought, I don't think it was a, uh, a witness. I think I brought it forward yep. and yep. agree that the language needs to be clear enough that it's um, not too extensive and broad. Okay, thank you. Can, can we ask, can, can, uh, excuse me, Senator Lyons, can, can yeah, we no, ask, no. Let's, let's make a specific ask that if the Provider Coalition has any comment on that, that they bring that forward to us so that we're, if, if there is a comment or suggestion uh, regarding, and I see Jessa Barnard has her hand up. Jessa has her hand up. I wasn't sure if you wanted to hear that now or in writing, um, but we, I'm happy to make a comment. It would point. be helpful just to make a comment. Sure, we we did discuss this informally, and I think our preference would be something general like state and federal guidance, um, because there are instances, for example, when the state does vary from CDC guidance um, in, in certain instances, or they may not always be 100% aligned, but if there were a general statement um, about uh, state and federal public health guidance, we would be comfortable with something more general like that. Okay, that okay. Well, well, that that will become a discussion point. So, thank you. Right. If you can put that in writing, it would also be helpful. And we can also make a note here. Um, flag that for future conversation. The next is the provision that allows the Secretary of Human Services to waive or permit variances from the agency's healthcare and human service provider rules as needed to prioritize and maximize direct patient care, support children and families receiving benefits and services through the Department for Children and Families, and allow for continuation of operations with reduced workforce and flexible staffing arrangements. This provision is in effect through March 31st of this year. The Provider Coalition is recommending extending that through March 31st of next year. And so this one is one where DCF, AHS, uh, and the agency will have to testify and also House uh, is gonna have to reach out to human services. Yes. I think, yeah, okay. Yes. Next is section Five, which allows the Green Mountain Care Board to waive and permit variances from laws, guidance, and standards on hospital budget review, certificates of need, health insurance rate review, and accountable care organization certification and budget review as needed to prioritize and maximize direct patient care, safeguard health care provider stability, and allow for orderly regulatory processes that are responsive to evolving COVID-related needs. This provision has currently expired it was also valid during the state of emergency and for six months afterward. The Provider Coalition is asking to extend that through March 31st um, of 2023. They also are asking for hospital, but a hospital budget review exemption for workforce costs. Um, and this was the piece that the Green Mountain Care Board recommended extending through um, 2022. Yes, through the end of yeah. 
2022. That that's another that's a point of discussion, and we've asked Green Mountain Care Board to work with hospitals on this, and perhaps get back to you, Jen. Not just the date, but the language. Yeah, the whole thing. Yep. I see Representative Goldman has a hand. Thank you. I'm just wondering if there are examples of how the Green Mountain Care Board used this provision, how it was, you know, really operate operationalized. Let's say. So that I think hopefully will be in the bullets that we've asked them to provide to us. Um, Is what Chair was Mullen useful. with us still? I can't it, tell from my screen. Neither. Kevin Mullen, are you here? Put it down for me. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not sure if he's. He's probably. Here. He's not. Yeah. I was just trying to get off mute. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are here. <laughs> we're used to using Teams, and so it, I'm not uh, as accustomed to Zoom. Oh well, I'm. I'm going to critique feel, Teams someday. Anyway, yeah, we feel <laughs> the same way about Teams. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come to Zoom. Come to Zoom. Anyway, so um, you heard that. Did you hear the question? Uh, if you could is, repeat it, it would be helpful. Yeah, Representative Golden, if you could repeat your question. I think I think Chair Mullen alluded to some of them, but more specificity would be helpful, perhaps. Yeah, I, I just maybe I didn't understand that context. So now I understand more about what he's referring to. But I was just looking um, to understand how um, that was used, um, the wave and permit variances, how it was used in your process um, during the um, like examples of how you use that during the pandemic. Sure, we use the um, language during the pandemic to um, change some of the uh, delivery dates for the budget submission. Um, we used it to um, reduce um, some of the items that had uh, previously been required to be reported by the hospitals. Um, and uh, primarily it was just to try to um, create less burden on the hospitals, recognizing that they had um, to put their focus rightly on the pandemic and to still allow for a process that uh, reviewed um, their budgets carefully. So I, I think it worked. Um, the hospitals may have a different opinion on that, but I think that the flexibility that was allowed under the previous legislation worked very well. And having that uh, um, six months till after the uh, state of emergency um, was very helpful. And just to give you an example of how it, it uh, could be used um, in the future coming year, as opposed to um, what happened in the past, what we've seen is that um, a number of capital projects were put on hold by the hospitals as uh, they were dealing with the pandemic. They didn't want construction workers running around and things like that until they had a handle on um, what was happening. So what we have now is a historical um, number of CONs um, coming into the board for capital projects and um, the flexibility in the uh, CON process, which wasn't really utilized as much um, in the, the, the previous bill would be very helpful in this one. So we could, uh, you know, truncate that process to uh, make it a little bit speedier. And um, we do have the ability to um, truncate it somewhat. And that's been seen in the uh, speedy processing of um, changes to the Miller building um, certificate of uh, need, which had placed uh, limits on the um, number of uh, beds that could be utilized. And we all saw that those beds were all utilized and had to, um, you know, speedily uh, uh, approve that so that uh, patients weren't denied care. If I may follow up quickly, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, so it's apparent that this expired on December 15th, which got you through your last year's budget process. I, um, you're starting your new one. Not having it in place right away will affect your, your uh, upcoming budget process or how will it affect it? Well, I'm not so sure that it 
um, the hospital budget process would necessarily be affected because we'll have to go through that uh, guidance discussion, which will occur um, in March. Um, but I would assume if we're at the same um, states of elevation that we're in now, um, the board wouldn't be asking the hospital for additional uh, information except for um, possibly uh, tweaking and refining some current uh, requests that we have. So for example, um, we've learned a lot in the um, investigation of the uh, wait times and we had allowed flexibility so that for example, UVM in the past has presented a different measure of uh, wait times than a number of their colleagues. And we think that uh, really needs to be uniform. And so um, that change would occur. I would hope that the hospitals would agree with that given the um, access and wait time um, issues that uh, are in front of everything, but they, they may have an objection to that. Um, but I think that uh, for the most part, um, just having the ability to um, make the uh, process a little bit smoother for the hospitals, um, if we continue in the, the, the current state of affairs would be helpful to the hospitals. And, um, you know, no one on the board wants to create undue work when that work could be spent better elsewhere, but we do need to get um, important information and, and that's a key part of our role. Thank you. Representative Donahue. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could clarify, did, is, is part of what you're saying that that existing statute locks you into some things that you do not have discretion to uh, address in the context of what you might need because of the pandemic? So you, you need the flexibility um, adjusted because you would not be able to do certain things that you think would be appropriate? Yeah, we have flexibility under the existing statute, but there are some things that uh, are specifically in statute as far as dates. And so let's say that there was, um, God forbid, uh, uh, a huge uh, uptick due to some new vari variant that occurred. Um, the board might want to have the flexibility to say that um, the actual decisions may not have to be made by September 15th or in writing by October 1st, but that would be um, dependent upon the environment that we were in at the time. And there was some discussion last time about uh, changing some of those dates, but in the end, we, we stuck to those dates. So um, I think that uh, having the flexibility is good. I think uh, it creates a lot more pressure on the board to use that uh, flexibility wisely, but I would hope that we would. Okay. Any other questions on this one? All right, good, thank you. And uh, th thank you for the clarification on that. That was, uh, I know you said some of that initially when you were here, but um, having additional conversation, I think has reinforced this for folks. Terrific. All right, Jen, let's, uh, why don't we move on to the, uh, seeing no more questions on that section. Let's move on to the next one, which I think is the first one. Can we return one. to the screen share? I think that would yep. be yeah. helpful. Yeah, just working on it. Uh, yep. First okay. one Thank on you. page two. Is that where we are? Yes, first one on page two. Yeah. And this section requires DIVA to relax the Medicaid provider enrollment requirements and DFR to direct health insurers to relax their insurance plans provider credentialing requirements to allow providers to deliver and be reimbursed for services across healthcare settings as needed to respond to evolving needs. This is in effect through March 31st of this year, and the Provider Coalition is proposing that that be extended until March 31st of next year. So we'll all need to hear from DIVA and DFR and uh, perhaps the in insurers and uh, at least 
I think Blue Cross and Blue Shield is here with us today, but I don't know if they're ready to testify on that one. And there are two questions. Um, I don't know who's first, but Representative Peterson and then Representative Goldman. Uh, yes, and uh, Chair Lyons, you may have answered the question. They need to testify on that because I just had some questions as to what they mean by relaxed Medicare provider enrollment, whether that's still this long into the pandemic still required. Um, I'd just like to hear more detail, but there's probably no one here that can give that detail. Um, that, that's what my question was. Hold on to it. <laughs> Will do. Representative Goldman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if by relaxing uh, credentialing requirements, there's been an increase in complaints or any problems along those lines. So that's a good question for uh, OPR and the, and the uh, board, uh, David Hurley of the board. And I don't know, I, I don't think, uh, are, is Lauren, are you still here? Yes, um, Madam Chair, I am. And if the question could just be relaxing which requirements um, have led to an increase. It said, we, yeah, this says relax health insurance plan provider credentialing oh. requirement. Oh, oh so that's that just for the health insurance plans. Okay. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Sorry. Okay, so that one that one would go uh, when Diva and DFR come in. Uh, you can hold that question. That's a really good question. And or would it be, or would it go to the health insurance plans themselves? You know, sort of what their experience has been of relaxing their requirements in terms of complaints. Sure, you know, so you'd want to hear from Blue Cross and Blue Shield or MVP or others. Uh, so they'll they should all be in on the list, I think. And Jessa Barnard has her hand up. Do you want to weigh in on this one? I just wanted to clarify sort of why we're asking for this one, since I don't think we've talked about it yet and sort of how it works in parallel with some of the flexibilities for the timing of licensure. So there's the licensure piece, which is your sort of credential to work in the state, but then there's also getting reimbursed by the payers. And so this is, you know, it, they work together and that if we're having teams come in or providers come in sort of at the last minute to help meet surge capacity needs. We also want um, them to be quickly enrolled um, to be able to be um, paid for that service. So that's kind of how it works in tandem with the licensure piece, but um, certainly would welcome hearing from DFR and DIVA how it's working from their perspectives. Okay. Thank, I'm going to thank, thank you, Jessa, for that clarification. I think that's helpful in trying to see how this fits together. Any other questions? All right, Jen, let's move on. We'll do one more and then we'll I'll probably be ready for break. Yep. Okay. Uh, so this one is section seven from Act 91 and this provision allowed the courts and the Department of Mental Health to waive financial penalties if a treating provider failed to comply with certain documentation and reporting requirements for involuntary treatment. And this provision was valid only during the COVID-19 state of emergency. So it has at this point expired and there is not a request as of yet to extend it. Yeah, we haven't heard from the Instated. judicial branch either. Uh, apparently there's not a, a problem that persists. So we can always talk about that. If you want to take testimony, go ahead. But I think there's been no recommendation for it. Right. Okay, any questions on that? Why don't you take your screen down, Jen, just to see if there are questions. Okay, so when we come back, <clears throat> we'll be on directing DFR. And um, so let's take a break for until 1025. Is that sufficient? Representative Lippert? I think that'll work. All right. Thank you. 